Welcome back everyone. I will discuss in this presentation another, another step in understanding neonatal respiratory physiology. And I will be talking about hypoxemic respiratory failure in neonates assessment and monitoring. I have two main objectives for today. The first objective to understand the problem for today, which is pathophysiology of hypoxemic respiratory failure. Second, how to assess and monitor hypoxemic respiratory failure. And both objectives for today. In another presentation, I will discuss in more details the physiologic based approach for the management of hypoxemic respiratory failure with some case scenarios. We know from the previous session that we have five main general mechanisms of hypoxemia. The first mechanism is hypoventilation. And hypoventilation when we have infant with high partial pressure of carbon dioxide and high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli as well as in the arterial blood. In this situation, the CO2 should be decreased in the alveoli as a pressure to allow more oxygen tension to be improved. So that's a kind of straightforward mechanism of hypoxemia. Second mechanism is limited diffusions. And it is unlikely to have limited diffusion as a separate mechanism of hypoxemia, uh, unless you have a rare case of alveolar capillary dysplasia. It's common to be associated with a VQ mismatch as another mechanism in bronchopulmonary uh, dysplasia in preterm infants. The third mechanism is one of the most common mechanisms of hypoxemia, ventilation perfusion mismatch. And I prefer to use al alveolar oxygenation instead of alveolar ventilation in the relationship to perfusion. So in this situation, we have alveolar oxygenation or um, the oxygen tension in the alveoli compromised in relationship to perfusion. The mechanism number four, right to left shunt or intrapulmonary sh uh, shunt. When you have ventilation perfusion mismatch with further and more severe uh, compromise of alveolar oxygenation. So alveoli getting more compromised or more collapsed, then the blood will be passed from the right side of the heart to the left side without getting any oxygen. And you are using the intrapulmonary shunt for this entity, entity, but it is actually, uh, it is extension or severe form of number three, which are alve alveolar ventilation in this situation severely compromised. If the problem is related to perfusion, not ventilation, or the blood flow through the lung is compromised, it could be due to shock or severe pulmonary hypertension when we have infant with high pulmonary vascular resistance, limiting the blood flow through the lung. Hypoxemia in neonatal intensive care unit is three main types. The first type is acute hypoxemia associated with acute respiratory failure, which is our topic for today. Second, chronic persistent hypoxemia, and the most common example for that, near-term or term infant, or even preterm infant with congenital cyanotic heart disease. When the arterial saturation cannot be um, maintained above low 80s or 85 percent and that's because of the congenital uh, heart disease or intra significant intra cardiac shunt the third mechanism chronic intermittent hypoxemia of prematurity which is proven to be associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcome 
and the last entity will be discussed in a different presentation but I will focus today on acute hypoxemia associated with acute respiratory failure the first section in our presentation today is to discuss pathophysiology of acute hy hypoxemic respiratory, fail respiratory failure and I have few important definitions to remember hypoxemia is arterial secretion less than 80 percent and it is the same definition used in Canadian oxygen trial and most of the international oxygen trials or target oxygen trials or partial pressure of oxygen less than 50 millimeter mercury usually the target um, oxygen pressure and the arterial blood is between 60 to 80 millimeter mercury so if if you have infant less than 50 millimeter mercury that's definitely hypoxia, hypoxemia especially if it is associated with low saturation and then hypoxia hypoxia by definition is low oxygen delivery and the high, low oxygen delivery it is not only saturation related it's also related to blood flow or cardiac output and also hemoglobin and these are the three the three components responsible for oxygen delivery which is in the product of, in the product of saturation cardiac output and the hemoglobin hyperoxemia which is high oxygen saturation higher than the upper limit of target saturation or partial pressure of oxygen high, higher than 90 millimeter mercury and that's only applicable if you have infant in oxygen because if you have the infant on room air it doesn't matter what, what is his saturation he might be with the saturation close to 100 which is normal and then hyperoxia which is high oxygen delivery and should be also associated with high partial pressure of oxygen at the tissue level and you are talking about infant on oxygen in this situation for example if you have a high oxygen delivery due to high cardiac output or high hemoglobin level in polythysemia that, that's not typically hyperoxia it should be associated with high saturation and high partial pressure of oxygen at the same time we have in this slide the interaction between heart pulmonary circulation and lungs and also the systemic vascular system in reaction to hypoxemia so if you have persistent hypoxemia not intermittent hypoxemia persistent oxygen saturation below 80 percent then the impact on both pulmonary vascular resistance and systemic vascular resistance will be um, in opposite directions so hypoxemia is pulmonary vasoconstrictor and will increase pulmonary vascular resistance but hypoxemia at the same time a systemic vasodilator and will drop systemic vascular resistance and that's one of the reasons why the blood pressure might drop if you have infant with hypoxemia and then with increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance at the same time decreased systemic vascular resistance the shunt through the fetal um, uh, com connections like PDA and beta ferrugin ovary will be reversed at right to left shunt and the next will be different hypoxia decreased oxygen delivery at the tissues hypercapnia increased pressure increased pressure of carbon dioxide and acidosis and the impact will be reflected back on systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance so it will be continuous circle at the same time the lung volume will be decreased compliance will be decreased and the intrapulmonary shunt will be increased with increasing hypoxemia 
hypercapnia and acidosis again the impact on pulmonary vascular system so the vascular tone will be increased and reactivity will be altered so the um, the reaction or the reactivity of the pulmonary circulation to high hypoxemia will be persistent and will be difficult to be reversed back with time with some structural um, changes in the pulmonary vasculature at the heart level the blood volume will be decreased and we'll, we'll discuss uh, the impact on the heart and heart performance later on in uh, the next few slides right ventricular pressure will will be increased with a high over, a high pressure overload and eventually right ventricle failure and then will be followed by lv dysfunction we have discussed before that we have five main mechanisms of hypoxemia in general it can in unit in adult but in newborn with hypoxemic respiratory failure we have three main pathophysiologic mechanisms the ventilation perfusion mismatch this is the most common one it is imbalance between alveolar oxygenation and perfusion so we have compromised alveolar oxygenation and maintained perfusion which will lead to alveolar hypoxia increased dead space at the end the second mechanism is actually extension or more severe uh, extreme of ventilation perfusion mismatch which is intrapulmonary shunt when we have more severe collapsed alveoli the shunt will be increased uh, between the right side of the heart to the left side so pulmonary arterial blood reaches the pulmonary venous side without passing through ventilated areas of the lung and then we have the extra pulmonary shunt right to left shunting of the blood bypasses the lung through fetal channels like ductus arteriosus and freemono valley that's definitely the pulmonary hypertension so these are the three main pathophysiologic mechanisms of hypoxemic respiratory failure in newborn in the in this slide we have ventilation perfusion mismatch with its extreme right left shunt on this side and on the other side we have decreasing perfusion so to understand both in one slide we can we consider both side by side so we have in the middle here the typical normal ventilation perfusion matching when we have normally ventilated lung and the blood passing through the lung and coming out of the lung fully oxygenated so that's our pulmonary arterial blood and passing through the lung getting oxygenated and coming out as pulmonary venous blood was fully saturated here we have ventilation perfusion matching the perfect in the perfect lung and perfect circulations around one but never been one even in adult normal adult it's around 0.8 because we have little bit less less ventilation expected to perfusion so the ratio is around 0.8 and also is considering the dead space then if we have the ventilation compromised and decreasing ventilation gradually then we have the point 0.8 became 0.6 so we have the ventilation part decreased with maintained Q or perfusion and then became 0.4 with further decrease in ventilation and maintained the Q or perfusion and then became 0.2 and at the end we have ventilation of zero no ventilation at all so both lungs are totally collapsed and there is no any alveolar oxygenation so the blood is passing through both lungs and coming out without getting any oxygen that cannot happen in uh, a live person in this condition we have the 100% or total right left shunt so that's right left shunt 
the blood is passing through the lung without getting any oxygen. The ventilation perfusion mismatch and the extreme of right left chunt is common in lung collapse, pneumonia, RDS, TTN, chronic lung disease with no pulmonary hypertension, lung congestion like in case of patent ductus arteriosus. On the other hand, we have decreasing perfusion. So the ventilation part is maintained, but the Q or the flow is decreasing. So the ratio now is more than one. It became 1.2 and then 1.4, 1.8 until you reach normal ventilation of one, but zero perfusion. There is no perfusion at all. It's similar to dead space. When you have the blood, there is no blood flow at all, but the air is coming in and out without getting ex. Uh, without getting any exposure to any blood. So that's ex extreme and cannot happen in a live person. But we have great decreased perfusion. It might happen with pulmonary hypertension, massive pulmonary embolism, shock with decreased perfusion, chronic lung disease but with, with significant pulmonary hypertension. And one of the most common mechanisms in neonate lung hyperinflation, when you have significant hyperinflation, was compression of the capillaries and compression of the blood flow. So we have two main extremes. So we have decreasing ventilation, with ventilation perfusion mismatch, and with decreasing ventilation severity, you have also at the same time increasing right drift chunt. On the other hand, we have decre decreasing perfusion with maintained ventilation, and we have several uh, common uh, reasons for that in neonates. Just to repeat what we have mentioned, but in a different way, in different slide. We have mismatched low inflation to perfusion, so or collapsed alveoli, and the blood is passing through the alveoli without getting oxygenated. So we have poor ventilation despite perfusion, which is uh, will end up by hypoxemia, and it's definitely intrapulmonary shunt. And we have mismatched, but mismatched when we have high inflation, so hyperinflation of the alveoli with significant compression of the capillaries, and it decreased the blood flow. So there's another type of mismatch. But in this situation, we have high ventilation and low perfusion, and the end result will be also hypoxemia. And we have the perfect lung we have when we have inflation, reasonable inflation, and normal perfusion, and the vacuous match is close to 1 or 0.8, as we, as we mentioned before. In this slide, we uh, will describe the, again the impact of overinflation from mechanical ventilation on uh, blood flow. So remember, we discussed before that the oxygen exchange is under control of three main pressures: the arterial pressure, the intraalveolar pressure and the venous pressure. So in the perfect lung, we have arterial pressure higher than inflation or alveolar pressure, and the alveolar pressure is higher than the venous pressure. In this situation, we have normal blood flow, and the blood flow is maintained during um, systole and most of the diastole, and my T is at the end of diastole. With hyperinflation, like in this example, the blood flow might cease or stop at the part of the cardiac cycle. So only early systole, the blood might pass and stop. That's due to hyperinflation and partial obstruction of the uh, capillaries. In this situation, we have the alveolar pressure might be slightly higher than the arterial pressure, especially at the, most of the cardiac cycle and the arterial pressure for sure is higher than the venous pressure. If you have um, deflated alveoli, then the blood flow will be very high 
and we have arterial pressure higher than venous higher than the alveolar pressure the common example of, the, uh, of this uh, model when we have infant with PDA and the high pulmonary blood flow this slide explains again the difference between the VQ mismatch and its extreme intrapulmonary right left chunt. So when we have a partially inflated alveolus which maintain the blood flow, the alveolus is non-compliant or highly resistant and even after applying maximal mean air pressure and there is no any other room, any other room to increase the pressure the next is to change the ratio between the alveolar nitrogen and replace part of the alveolar nitrogen by alveolar oxygen so we have to give extra oxygen to replace the alveolar nitrogen so the ratio will be um, different from someone who is in a um, uh, inhaling room air so if you have alveolar oxygen less than 90 which is normal around 100 then we might need to replace part of the nitrogen pressure or nitrogen in the alveoli by giving extra oxygen higher than room air so that's a, the, the steps of treating VQ mismatch we, we have to optimize mean air pressure first to reach the, max, the maximal uh, uh, the maximal allowed pressure to inflate the alveolus before considering oxygen uh, supplementation but if the alveolus is deflated totally deflated and there is no any other way to inflate the alveolus in this situation giving extra oxygen is useless so we have the blood passing from the uh, right side of the heart to the left side without getting any oxygen which is right to left shunt intrapulmonary right to left shunt so if you give extra oxygen that's not going to help because the alveolus is totally collapsed so remember that when we have significant right to left shunt you might not able to optimize the saturation up to your target saturation that you are aiming for In this example, we uh, have used the oxygen, oxygen challenge test or oxygen reduction test to evaluate the VQ mismatch. And in this example, it was kind of mild to moderate case of a VQ mismatch. So the oxygen requirement to begin with and the, uh, with the oxygen reduction test was around 35 pressure of oxygen by kappa, which is the same like 35 if you are at the sea level. Uh, of in, uh, inhaled um, FiO2 like 35% oxygen in uh, FiO2 and then we started to reduce stepwise by 2% 2 to 3% and watching the saturation and the stepwise should be every 5 to 10 minutes and watching the saturation at the same time so the saturation dropped from 94 to 84 percent when the FIA2 dropped from 35 to 26 percent and you can see the drop here on the curve and the software estimated the VQ mismatch as 0.37 compared to normal which is 0.8 that's really significant drop and the uh, the right drift chunt approximately around 20 percent VQ mismatch without significant right left shunt is very responsive to oxygen. When you reduce the oxygen, the saturation will drop. And it is at the beginning, like the uh, steep part of the curve. But if you have the, another example, infant with severe VQ mismatch and significant right left shunt, uh, 
in the in this infant he was requiring high oxygen higher than uh, 55 uh, at 55% to begin with and we were able to reduce uh, down to 44% without significant reduction in saturation because actually the the curve is at the flat part of the curve with right drift shunt when you reduce the oxygen or increase the oxygen you will not get significant improvement in saturation so keep increasing the oxygen higher and higher until you reach maybe 70% or 90% you will not get uh, the oxygen target saturation that you are aiming for when you have significant right drift shunt so right drift shunt in this case was 25% and the VQ match was severe by 0 0.21 Remember again, you can reduce the oxygen significantly or increase oxygen in the, the different direction without significant change in the situation. But in the VQ mismatch, mild to moderate VQ mismatch without significant right to left shunt is more sensitive to the oxygen reduction. So we have just a small change in the situation resulted in significant change. A small change in the FI2 resulted in significant change in saturation. Now we'll shift to PBHN or pulmonary hypertension uh, at birth. We have in the fetal circulation very high pulmonary vascular resistance and a very low pulmonary blood flow. At the same time, very high pulmonary artery pressure. That's actually during fetal life. But after birth and after inflation of the lung, the blood flow will increase significantly. With the inhalation of room air or maybe oxygen, if you have infant or with the respiratory disease, the pulmonary artery pressure will drop because of significant drop of, uh, of pulmonary vascular resistance, at the same time, the pulmonary blood flow will be improved. And you can see in this uh, slide, the pulmonary vascular resistance significantly dropped, but the pulmonary artery pressure did not drop at this, to the same level. Remember, pulmonary artery pressure is uh, determined by both blood flow and resistance. So because of the blood flow increased, the pulmonary artery pressure did not drop to the same level of decreased pulmonary vascular resistance. So the blood flow is contributing also to the pulmonary artery pressure. In this slide, we have five main um, pathophysiologic causes of pulmonary hypertension in neonates. The first is hypoxemic vasoconstriction, which is a typical one, the most common one, due to meconium aspiration or hypoxia at birth. So the pulmonary vasculature did not relax at birth, and pulmonary artery pressure uh, continued to be maintained almost at the same level of the fetal high level. That's because of high vasoconstriction. So pulmonary vascular resistance did, uh, resistance did not drop significantly. The second mechanism, abnormal vasoconstriction, due to premature closure of the ductus arteriosus or alveolo alveolar capillary dysplasia. That's one of the rare mechanisms. The third mechanism is also common, the same like the first one, which is pulmonary vascular hypoplasia in congenital diaphragmatic hernia, oligohydriamnos or potter sequelae or syndrome. When you have the vasculature hypoplastic and cannot be relaxed in this situation, unlikely to be uh, responsive to pulmonary vasodilators, the same like uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction. Number four, excessive pulmonary blood flow. And you might be surprised when we describe congenital heart defects with left-right shunt or PDA, 
could be associated with pulmonary hypertension. Remember from the previous slide, I, we have mentioned that pulmonary artery pressure is in the product of resistance and the blood flow. Here we have low resistance, but we, we have very high blood flow, which might result in high pulmonary artery pressure. And for sure in this uh, situation, you should not give pulmonary vasodilators, but you should rather uh, close the shunt and decrease the pulmonary blood flow. And then we have number five, pulmonary venous hypertension. So the problem here, we have infant with increased pressure at the uh, left atrial side or left heart side, like congenital heart defects with left atrial hypertension, mitral valve disease or aortic valve disease. We have the pressure is higher than normal in the left atrium. And because there is no valve between left atrium and pulmonary uh, veins so the pressure will be reflected back on the pulmonary veins and will cause at the end also hypoxemia because of significant pulmonary um, congestion and increased venous pressure so let us explain one by one we have pulmonary artery pressure is dependent on two main factors resistance and the blood flow so if you have high resistance, like in this uh, cartoon, so the right ventricle is contracting against vasoconstricted pulmonary arterial vasculature. The typical example, PPHN or pulmonary vascular hypoplasia. In this situation, we have the right ventricle is contracting against high resistance and will develop right ventricle high after load and it might end up by right ventricular failure. Resistance, and this example is related to capillary resistance, not arterial resistance. And the typical example, as we mentioned before, hyperinflated lung. So the lungs in hyperinflated and uh, compress, compresses the, the capillary circulation and the resistance is high to allow the arterial pulmonary blood to be reaching the left atrium. In this case, the infant will be behaving the same like pulmonary hypertension with decreased size of the left atrium and decreased the cardiac output. And you can recognize that in the X-ray as hyperinflated lungs and small size heart because of the decreased venous return from the pulmonary uh, venous uh, drainage. We may have also one of the rare situations when we have venous resistance due to pulmonary venous stenosis. We have a stenosis at the pulmonary uh, venous end. So we have, we have resistance not allowing normal venous return from the pulmonary uh, venous circulation to the left atrium. This is one of the rare uh, scenarios and uh, it's difficult to be diagnosed by echo and it might need to be diagnosed by cardiac cath. And then we have in this example the blood flow is high so we have normal or low resistance we have no issues with the resistance but we have high blood flow, which could be high arterial and the common case scenario, left to right shunt, like PDA. So we have high blood flow to the pulmonary circulation due to significant PDA. In this case, we will have high blood flow in the arterial pulmonary circulation and distended capillaries compression of the alveoli and compression of the lung and causing VQ mismatch and dilated pulmonary veins and because of the re there is no valve between pulmonary veins and the left atrium the left atrium will be significantly dilated and also left ventricle so the left heart will be dilated and congested and then we have the last uh, mechanism 
the pulmonary venous hypertension when we have infantose mitral or aortic valve disease or any uh, congenital heart disease with high pressure in the left atrium so the pressure will be reflected back on the pulmonary venous uh, circulation and also the end result will be hypoxemia the conclusion of the pathophysiology section it is very crucial to know the pathophysiologic mechanism of hypoxemic respiratory failure to target your management vq mismatch with its severe extreme intrapulmonary right drift shunt and pulmonary hypertension are the most common pathophysiologic mechanisms now we'll shift to section number two monitoring of hypoxic respiratory failure in NICU. Oxygen monitoring and related issues. It's not really easy to monitor oxygen in hypoxemic respiratory failure. We are relying on pulse oximetry, which is actually unreliable for monitoring of hyperoxia. It might be reliable for hypoxemia, but not for hyperoxia. Relying on single target saturation for all cases and ignoring the complexity of oxygenation physiology. So we are most of us uh, respecting to maintain oxygen between our um, target saturation according to our guidelines in the unit. So some units they have 90 to 95 or 88 to 92 but that cannot be uh, maintained in all cases with hypoxemic respiratory failure and we'll discuss that in more details uh, when we uh, start to discuss case scenarios and the management relying on the data from oxygen trials and all of these trials were not designed for targeting oxygen saturation and hypoxemic respiratory failure they were designed to, dis to study safe, the safe baseline target saturation for better long-term outcomes. And even they did not give clearly any answer for these outcomes. So at the, at the end, we don't have uh, one target saturation can, can be applicable for all cases. And I'm talking mainly about hypoxemic respiratory failure I'm not talking about hypoxemic intermittent hypoxemia of prematurity or chronic persistent hypoxemia so we're focusing in this presentation again on acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and one of the, one of the issues with the pulse oximetry the overlap between target saturation So most of the um, oxygen trials, they considered two main target saturations, 85 to 89% in one arm, 91 to 95 in another arm. But in fact, there is in the pulse oximetry there is significant overlap because any number in the pulse oximetry is, a, is considered as mean with two standard deviation and the 3% 3% uh, lower and 3% higher. For example, if you have 85%, it can be 82%. If you have 89%, it can be also up to 92%. So we have 3% higher, 3% lower. At the same time, the saturation between 91 to 95, it is anything between 88 to 98%. So we have significant overlap in all of the studied oxygen trials. So actually we cannot rely on any um, of these uh, target saturation uh, results from these uh, trials. Not because of the design of the studies, but mainly because of the uh, anomaly of the pulse oximetry. Back to uh, pulmonary hypertension, to clinically diagnose pulmonary hypertension before echocardiography, 
in one of the um, randomized controlled trials of pulmonary hypertension, they considered one of two clinical findings to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, either pre and post ductal saturation difference of more than 5% or more than two desaturations, desaturation events in 12 hours. So you have three or more desaturation in 12 hours and it should be uh, no any other lung, expected lung disease associated. So there is no any suspicion of lung disease. And we are talking about near term and term infants, not preterm infants in this study. And the saturation, desaturation is lower than 85%. So you have three or more desaturations less than 85% in 12 hours period, and you don't have any suspicion of, of lung disease, then you may consider desaturations could be due to pulmonary hypertension. Pre and post ductal saturation difference is only valid if you have infant with open ductus. So if you have echocardiography, confirm it closed ductus, then we should not expect a significant difference between pre and post ductal saturation, even if you have sobra systemic pulmonary hypertension. Elevated pulmonary vascular resistance promotes shunting through intracardiac fetal ch channels. So we have the blood shunting through the beta frequent valley and the ductus arteriosus and causing the difference between pre and post ductus saturation. So at the end we have the blood in the left ventricle is desaturated because of the right uh, to left shunt beta frequent valley and we have difference between the first part of the aorta and the descending aorta so right uh, hand different from the one of the lower limb saturation because of the shunting through the ductus arteriosus elevated pulmonary vascular resistance affects heart function so first right heart function the right atrium will not be filled well because of the high pressure at the same time right ventricle will be dilated with decreased contractility because of the high afterload so the function of the right ventricle will be um, affected gradually and then the left ventricle will be affected as well with decre decreased contractility Echocardiography is very helpful when we apply short axes to the ventricles. So the normal ratio between left ventricle and right ventricle, left ventricle is more dilated and the septum is more rounded and giving impression of rounded left ventricle and crescent like right ventricle. But in pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle is more dilated and compressing the septum and making the septum appears more flattened compared to rounded septum in normal uh, subject and when the right ventricle became more and more dilated with increasing right ventricular pressure above the left ventricular pressure then the septum will be more boosted or pushed from the right ventricle to the left ventricle With more deterioration, the septum will be, as I mentioned, will be pushed from right ventricle to the left ventricle, causing significant compression and decreasing the blood flow and the cardiac output. And at the end, the left ventricle will be, um, function will be affected and became very poor. The slide of oxygen dissociation, dissociation curve is explaining that relying on saturation only 
uh, is not enough especially if you are monitoring hyperoxia or hyperoxemia so if you have the partial pressure of oxygen around 80% we may have saturation 95 and because of the flattening of oxygen curve at the top was increasing and held the oxygen the partial pressure will be increasing up to 600 but the saturation will be between 95 to 100 or 90 to 100 on the top part of oxygen saturation curve So we are aiming to maintain the saturation between 88 or 90 to 95 percent and partial pressure of oxygen between 60 and 80 millimeter mercury to optimize the oxygen delivery which is around 20 uh, ml per 100 ml of blood. So physiologically, it is important to optimize oxygen delivery. And the oxygen delivery is a product of cardiac output or the blood flow, which is heart rate multiplied by stroke volume, and the oxygen content of the blood, which is uh, the product of saturation and hemoglobin. So if you are monitoring only saturation and we are not monitoring or optimizing the hemoglobin or the blood flow, then we are not sure that the oxygen delivery is optimized or not. This is regarding oxygen delivery, but even if you have enough oxygen delivery, we are in need to know the oxygen consumption. We need to know if the tissue can consume normal oxygen or not. So the pulse oximetry can give you a number, 97%. That's the saturation of the arterial blood that reaching the tissues but we need to know how much left over in the venous compartment which can be detected by another machine which is near infrared spectroscopy and the difference between both is how much consumed by the tissues so the normal consumption with the tissues is around 30 percent or 25 to 30 percent remember that the 97 percent is just a mean between two standard deviation on the pulse oximetry so it can be anything between 94 to 100 percent so three below and three above and we should be relying not only in the difference between both but in the fractional oxygen extraction which is uh, normal between 0.15 to 0.33 and how to calculate fractional oxygen extraction it is arterial saturation minus the venous mixed venous saturation which can be replaced by the tissue oxygen saturation reflected on the near near for the spectroscopy machine and then the result is divided by the oxygen arterial saturation so the result is fraction and the normal fraction, normal fractional oxygen extraction between 0.15 to 0.33 and by the way the normal oxygen delivery in the units it's between 20 to 40 ml per kg per minute and the normal tissue oxygen saturation on the uh, mixed venous blood or measured by near spectroscopy it's between 60 to 80 percent according to our guidelines in our unit. This three-dimensional graph is explaining the relationship between oxygen delivery at the lower uh, x-axis and fractional oxygen extraction and the upper x-axis and the oxygen consumption at the vertical y-axis so we have normal the normal box here with oxygen delivery between 20 up to 40 ml 
of oxygen per kg per minute. That's a normal oxygen delivery. And to maintain normal oxygen delivery, we have normal the oxygen extraction between 0.15 to 0.33 to maintain our oxygen consumption, which is really variable between tissues, but it is approximately between 4 to 8 ml. Can be slightly lower or can be slightly higher in some tissues. 4 to 8 ml of oxygen per kg per minute. And uh, again, oxygen delivery is component uh, or relying on three main components the hemoglobin, arterial saturation, and the cardiac output. So, any, any one of these um, gets affected or decreased or compromised, then the oxygen delivery will be lower than normal. And if the oxygen delivery is decreasing to maintain normal oxygen consumption, the extraction should be increased. So the tissue will extract more oxygen from the venous compartment to maintain normal consumption. So extraction will be increased more than 33% to 40% to 50% uh, as a compensatory mechanism to decreasing oxygen delivery to maintain consumption but this extraction cannot be uh, maintained and, in, and increasing uh, down to zero there is a limit which is about 60% or 65% beyond that the tissue cannot extract anymore and with more decrease in the oxygen delivery the end result will be shift from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and the production of lactic acidosis and this will, this will be associated with decreased oxygen consumption and will end, the end result will be tissue, tissue damage and necrosis if not treated within short period of time so we have uh, the normal oxygen delivery with normal extraction and normal consumption zone A and we have zone C, the compensatory, me, compensatory zone, when we have low oxygen delivery, but compensated by increased oxygen extraction with maintained oxygen consumption. And we have zone D, which is a very bad area when we have lactic acidosis and, the, and uh, no more room to, for the extraction to be increased with significant decrease in oxygen consumption. We have also zone B, when we have normal delivery, but significantly decreased oxygen extraction. That's because of the tissues are not healthy enough to extract the oxygen, and the consumption is very low. That's example for hypoxic ischemic insult. Or after recovery from zone D, when we have very sick tissues and cannot um, consume normal oxygen, even if the oxygen delivery improved back to normal. Conclusions of the section of oxygen monitoring. Pulse oximetry can monitor hyper, hy, hypoxemia but not tissue hypoxia. It is not optimal for monitoring hyperoxia. Monitoring partial pressure of oxygen is important for assessment of hyperoxia, but it is technically difficult, especially in premature infants. But if we have near ferritin spectroscopy, which is another adjunct monitoring for assessment of oxygen consumption and tissue hypoxia, it might be another um, alternative uh, to optimize tissue oxygenation if we don't have continuous monitoring of partial pressure of oxygen. And then we'll shift to oxygen therapy. And I just, I would like to introduce oxygen therapy by uh, the discussion about the consequences or the complications of oxygen therapy.
It is really a challenge to treat hypoxemic respiratory failure without increasing the burden of hyperoxia. Consequences of hyperoxia. Particularly if you have high inspired oxygen, more than 0.5, fraction of higher inspired oxygen more than 0.5, and with high oxygen pressures, higher than 80 millimeter mercury, I mean arterial partial pressure of oxygen, can lead to gradual increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So, chronic exposure of the lung to oxygen might lead to, at the end, to pulmonary hypertension, which might be strange for, to some of you. Gradual increase in systemic vascular resistance with systemic hypertension and we might be familiar with a lot of premature infants when they reach uh, most menstrual age higher than 36 weeks and they develop pulmonary uh, sorry systemic hypertension after long time exposure to oxygen and bird oxygen consumption at the tissue level and loss of tissue nitrogen through the lung. Hyperoxia reduces oxygen consumption in children with pulmonary hypertension. That's actually proven in one of the literature. Hemodynamic effects of acute hy hyperoxia. Hyperoxia might considerably decrease cardiac output and increase systemic vascular resistance. There is currently no evidence supporting the notion that oxygen supplementation increases oxygen delivery. And, I'm a, uh, and we discussed in, in details that oxygen delivery is in the product of hemoglobin and the blood flow plus oxygen saturation. So it's not only, rely, uh, on, not only dependent on oxygen saturation. And we have the nitrogen and the alveoli Nitrogen is very important to maintain alveoli distended and to maintain functional residual capacity. So this is a function of the nitrogen, not the oxygen. And we have continuous uh, passage of the nitrogen from blood to alveoli at the same time from alveoli to the blood, and the net result is zero. In case of inhalation of oxygen, the nitrogen balance will be negative with higher venous partial pressure of nitrogen compared to arterial, which means loss of nitrogen or loss of body nitrogen to maintain alveolar nitrogen. Then we'll shift to discussion about management of hypoxemic respiratory failure in three steps. Evaluation of pathophysiologic mechanism is the first step. Optimize alveolar ventilation is a priority before increasing oxygen supplementation or start of pulmonary vasodilators. So the first step, we have to understand what is the vasophysiologic mechanism. We have to understand what we are treating and then consider optimizing the alveolar ventilation by giving the priority to in, uh, maintain alveolar at the functional residual capacity before applying oxygen supplementation and applying oxygen also is a priority before uh, considering pulmonary vasodilators. And then assessment of the acceptable target saturation for each particular case was optimal oxygen delivery and consumption. So we have to consider um, a target saturation um, acceptable according to the pathophysiologic mechanism. We cannot generalize all of the target, the target, one target situation for all patients. But the management of hypoxemic respiratory failure will be discussed in more details in the next presentation. Thank you for listening.